Welcome, I'm Nikki Jovakik from Look Up Strata and also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate on the Gold Coast. Today we're speaking with Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers about reasonable bylaws. Are your bylaws reasonable or could they be called harsh or oppressive? If your bylaws are unreasonable, can they be enforced? Can the owner's corporation or your strata manager be fined for unreasonable bylaws? Alison will provide an overview of some of the recent decisions affecting bylaws in order to review what is or is not a reasonable bylaw. We remind everyone that this is a New South Wales session and any reference to legislation is specific to the state of New South Wales. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information in this session, including the discussions arising from submitted questions and chat conversations, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice, and you should always seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. And we're delighted to be joined again today by Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers. Alison is a strata lawyer who has provided general strata advice, acted in strata disputes and worked with clients in preparing and enforcing bylaws and strata management statements since 2008. From 2012 onwards, Alison has acted exclusively on behalf of owners corporations and lot owners in respect of both strata and community association disputes and building and construction disputes. Alison has expertise and extensive experience in commercial litigation and dispute resolution and her knowledge across a variety of strata scheme matters enables her to advise owners, corporations, lot owners and other interested parties on a range of issues and to represent their interests both informally and before the courts. So we welcome Alison, thanks so much and it's really great to have you here again today. Hi, thank you for inviting me, Nikki. Really appreciate it. Real pleasure to be here today and doing something that I really feel passionate about, which is educating people about strata. And I know it's a bit nerdy, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, let's get on to it because we've got an action packed agenda. I'm just going to share my screen. The aims of today is I'm just going to go through some of the decisions um, about our bylaws in this harsh, unconscionable and oppressive um, limitation, basically, that have come through in the last, well, I'm going to cheat. I said 12 to 18 months, but I've actually gone a wee bit back further than that because I, I actually wanted to see how the case law has progressed to get to where we are today. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. As I said, I find it kind of cool. Um, I always put this slide up with what is strata and community title when I do a talk on strata and community titles. Why? Because I think it's just a really good, sounds like I'm patting myself on the back there, um, maybe I am, but a really good, um, easy way to understand strata title, which is basically a form of ownership that allows multiple people to own airspace in a building and to own a share in the common property of that building or the buildings. And community title, very, very similar. Um, I describe them as the horizontal stratas uh, because generally the lot owners own their land and the airspace around that land. So anything that's built on that land, they generally will own. Really, really general explanations, but good ones to keep in mind. Um, I always also stick this slide up as to why strata community title law is important. And this is why you should be subscribing to, to look up strata is we have a huge amount of property um, that is in strata. So that typo or that um, amount, the 404-358-229-265, that's not a typo. Um, that is the estimated value in 2020 of strata property in New South Wales. Um, so please go and check out the um, City Futures reports. Um, I have the links there and that's where this information comes from. Uh, but in 2020, there was 83, nearly 84,000 odd strata schemes. Um, there's now estimated to be over 100,000, but we just don't have the precise statistics on that yet. Um, these are some of the statistics from, again, the City Futures report, because I think they're going to be quite interesting when we're talking about harsh, unconscionable and oppressive, because we've got to have a look at who lives in our strata schemes and who owns in our strata schemes. So um, in 2020, 40% of residents in our strata schemes live or were born in Australia. Um, the vast majority, obviously 60%, um, were not born in Australia. So we're looking at a real multicultural environment. Um, that goes into the languages as well. Only, uh, sorry, only 45% of people spoke English at home. 
Um, and so there's a huge majority of schemes out there where people don't speak English at home. Um, tenure is really important as well. You know, 48% of our strata lots were rented. Um, this is in 2020. Um, and if you have a look at this, 48% of people that lived in our apartments were the 29 to 39 years old. Another large proportion there, 40 to 59, 21%, and then over 60s being 15%. Now, I've included those because, as I said, you need to actually think about who's living in our strata schemes to try and determine what is reasonable um, and what is going to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. We've got huge um, variety of age groups, a huge variety of people that own, that rent, that own with a mortgage, that aren't occupied, 11% weren't occupied in 2020. Um, and you've got a large proportion of different languages being spoken at home. So that needs to guide some of our decision making as well. And I think that needs to decide some, uh, guide some of the tribunal's decision making in these cases. Um, this is the acts that apply, the Community Lands uh, Management Development uh, Act, the Strata Schemes Development Act, the Strata Schemes Management Act, and there's the abbreviations I'll be using um, during this talk. Two of the big changes that are going to affect us um, here were on 1 December 2021, the Community Lands Management Act 2021 uh, and the Community Lands Management Act came into play and they introduced section 130, subsection 1, which is the equivalent of our Strata Schemes Management Act section 139, subsection 1. What's that? That's the restriction that bylaws must not be harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. And that's what we're talking about today. Now, the 1 July 2021 change that was brought about um, in the Strata Schemes Management Act is also important. Why? Because that act introduced a new keeping of animals regime, and that's going to inform what is harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Uh, and it introduced uh, new enforcement mechanisms and new special resolution requirements for sustainability infrastructure. Um, but key one there is the new keeping of animals regime because that's where it tends to get um, nasty, let's just say, in strata schemes. Uh, now, you've already guessed by my reference to R2-D2 on the stormtrooper over my shoulder, I'm not getting my ducks in my row, I'm getting my troopers in a row. Um, this is what we're talking about. Section 139, a bylaw cannot be unjust. A bylaw must not be harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. If it is, upon application to the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, I'll also call it NCAT, um, then NCAT can declare that bylaw to be invalid. Now, there's no reported cases under the Community Lands Management Act yet, but keep in mind that that change only came in very, very recently. Um, so what we're going to do is look at the schemes under the Strata Schemes Management Act. The one catch for those of you who are looking after community title schemes or living in community title schemes is it's going to have a slightly different effect, this harsh, unconscionable and oppressive restriction in community title schemes. Why? Because community title schemes um, have a provision there enabling bylaws that relate to the control, development, preservation of the essence or theme of the development. So it means that you can basically say this is going to be a golf resort scheme, for instance, or this will be a marina development. So it does have a little bit more, um, a, a, or a little bit less, I should say, um, applicability to the harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Um, why? Because we can have themed developments and we've got to read the restriction in line with that um, the theme of the development so I'll jump around a little bit but only this once um, why because the Cooper case it's one that I think most people in New South Wales would know about uh, it was decided in October 2020 by the New South Wales Court of Appeal um, it is the highest level of decision that we have which is why I'm going straight there um, and then I'll take you through some of the, the case law that's developed since then and before then. Um, so the Cooper case, uh, Angus uh, was a little mini schnauzer. Uh, Angus has unfortunately passed, uh, but Angus and the Coopers did some good work for those of us in New South Wales who are animal lovers. They challenged a bylaw that had a complete prohibition on the keeping of animals. 
The bylaw was found to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Why? Because essentially it restricted a fundamental property right, which was the right to use the property. Um, and the right to use the property included the right to keep animals. Um, the act being prohibited, which was keeping Angus, um, did not adversely affect any other owner or occupant of the scheme. And then thirdly, the bylaw was found not to be for a proper purpose. So that's the case law that we've got. And as I said, that's the highest level of case law that we've got. So all the cases since then have been interpreted in light of Cooper using these three points. So if you're going to take anything away from the presentation today, take a screenshot of this slide or take a copy of this slide. Um, and I think it's going to be the sessions being recorded, so it should be available afterwards. But this is the absolute fundamental as to what bylaws are going to be looked at and tested on under. So there's my boys. White Nose is Melvin. Big boy, the gorgeous boy. They're both gorgeous, but big boy is Ollie. Um, so you can see animal lover here. Um, in Cooper, the, the quote from Cooper or one of the two money quotes from Cooper is that a bylaw that limits the property rights of lot owners is only valid if it protects from adverse affectation the use and enjoyment by other occupants of their own lots or of the common property. Well, what does that mean? Good question. Uh, Justice Baston explains it, perhaps not as well as he could have for non-lawyers, but he does explain it. He says a bylaw that restricts the rights of all owners as to the use and enjoyment of their lots. So a bylaw that restricts your rights in using your lot um, in circumstances where the prohibited use would not interfere with the use and enjoyment of any other lot. So me in using my lot doesn't, doesn't affect anybody else is what he's saying. That is not a bylaw which has the regard to the interests of all lot owners, nor is it for the benefit of all the lot owners. Uh, within the terms of Section 9 of the Strata Schemes Management Act. So a bylaw that restricts my use right of my lot, that that use, where that use would not interfere with the use or enjoyment of any other lot, doesn't have the regard for interests of all lot owners. So it doesn't consider the interests of all lot owners and it's not for the benefit of all lot owners. And therefore it fails this adverse affectation test. So Hopefully that's a, a little bit less legalese for you to follow with the, the testing. Now, these are some of the cases that have come out um, after Cooper. And there's been a whole swathe of cases. I'm pulling out and cherry picking the interesting ones. Franklin was a December 2022 one. Uh, and the bylaw regulated cooking in lots. I've actually extracted the bylaw um, so that you can see it cooking of any nature, including toasting of bread, was prohibited. Um, unless you had the original cooking facilities installed by the original owners um, of the, the scheme. Um, and to give you context, the rooms were, well, the, the lots were quite small. Most of them were just a room uh, and a bathroom, um, almost like a little ensuite. And the reason being is because the scheme or the building had previously been an aged care facility uh, and then it was converted to strata. So there were 87 residential lots, 13 utility lots, I think only about four from memory had cooking facilities that had been installed as a part of the original build. So the vast majority of lots were prohibited from cooking. They could use a kettle, but you can't toast bread. Um, and then there was a, a, a rule down the bottom, which is subsection three. If they did cook and then a smoke alarm was triggered, then the lot owner was going to be responsible for reimbursing the owner's corporation any charge by the fire brigade. So that was the bylaw. What happened to the bylaw? Because that's pretty bad. I mean, you can't cook in your lot, can't cook toast. Um, well, it was found to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Why? It was the effect on the owner's lot. Cooking is a feature or a right of property ownership or occupation. So lot owners, although there were common area facilities for cooking, um, lot owners might not have wanted to have used that. Imagine, you know, you're feeling sick, you want a piece of toast, um, you don't want to get out of your jimmy jams and go down to the common facilities, uh, but the bylaw prohibited you cooking toast in your, your lot unless you had one of the, the original kitchens. Um, so cooking, that was an absolute feature of property ownership. 
um, the blanket ban could only be valid if it protected against unreasonable interference with another occupant's use and enjoyment of their lot. And it didn't. There was no evidence that cooking in a lot would cause an, an increased fire risk or a smell that couldn't be managed. And that the member even went so far as to say, well, yes, cooking does produce some smells, some odours. Um, there's nothing to say that you can't open a window and get rid of those odours. Um, so it was a very sensible decision, I think, um, in, uh, in Franklin. Well, I think we could have gone a little bit too far. Let me just take us back. Let we go. This is the, the Lou case. Again, relatively recent, so last year case. Um, this was a bylaw that regulated short-term rental accommodation arrangements, or as people that are normal like to say, short-term letting. Um, it allowed the owner's corporation uh, to restrict access to a lot by deactivating the access keys to that lot if the short-term letting bylaw was breached and to recover the owner's corporation's costs as if they were a levy debt and made the owners of the scheme give an indemnity as to the costs under this bylaw. Um, now, this was an appeal panel case. The appeal panel found it to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Why? Again, we've got that. It's restricting a fundamental property right, which is the right to access your property. Secondly, there was no power under the Strata Schemes Management Act to enable an owner's corporation to treat debts as if they were levy contributions. So we failed on two fronts um, in Lou. Lou was also picked up on in, I'm going to say it's Kozakus. I've mispronounced it the whole way through and I stick my hand up, I did act in this manner. Um, and yes, I mispronounced it while in the matter. Um, so in this case, there was actually three bylaws. Um, all of the bylaws had a cost recovery provision um, in them in some way, shape or form. Um, the Lou case was picked up to say, well, all of these bylaws were beyond power because there was no power under the Strata Schemes Management Act to recover costs um, as if they were levies. Uh, and they were also harsh, unconscionable and oppressive and therefore invalid because they removed the ability of a lot owner to challenge costs. Why? Because it predetermined, the bylaw predetermined that the lot owner was responsible for those costs. Um, there are a few other issues um, in that one of the bylaws um, breached or, or had a term that was in breach of section 137A, which is the occupancy rights. But the, the key thing to take away here is the bylaw saying you can recover costs was beyond power. It was also harsh, unconscionable and oppressive because it removed the ability of the lot owner to challenge the costs. Um, so you can see a theme coming through with some of these cost recovery bylaws. Um, Neri. Uh, is an April 2021 case. Uh, the bylaw, well, the bylaw was actually, and it was very unusual, this case, the bylaw was actually um, talked about in sections or subclauses. So by that, I mean, where you see a bylaw that has, um, you know, uh, let's just say bylaw 1.1, bylaw 1.2, bylaw 1.3. Um, Neri, they actually talked about uh, bylaw, I think it was, or subsection four of the bylaw um, and talked about it as if it was a, um, a completely separate bylaw from the rest of the bylaw within which it was housed. Um, all of the other acts considered the bylaw, if it was invalid by one term, then it invalidated the entire bylaw. In this case, very, very different to what else had gone before and after for that matter, um, they just invalidated a particular section, um, which was this, I think it was paragraph four, um, was deemed to be invalid. Um, so the bylaw itself was for a car park management system. Um, it allowed the owner's corporation to um, place notifications on a vehicle where you parked in visitors parking, basically, uh, and then to recover the owner's corporation's fees for doing so and to recover it as if it were a debt. So another cost recovery bylaw is what we're looking at. And again, it was found to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Again, no power under the um, Strata Schemes Management Act, but for a slightly different um, reason, they found that these um, fees were actually penalties. 
um, rather than costs. So it said, uh, uh no way, you do not have power to impose penalties. Um, by imposing penalties, you are basically trying to um, extricate yourself from section 147 of the, sorry, of the Strata Schemes Management Act and section 38 um, of the Civil and Administrative Tribunal Act. And both of those sections um, allow for the tribunal to impose penalties upon a lot owner for breaching um, either orders or breaching a bylaw if you've taken a, a notice to comply um, case. Um, so NCAT was very protective of its jurisdiction and said, you can't do that because this bylaw is trying to circumvent um, the or these acts, the Strata Schemes Management Act and the Civil and uh, Administrative Tribunal Act. Um, now, there were, in this case, again, it was a wee bit unusual, there were amended bylaws. It looked like the Owners Corporation had tried to strap up its bylaws, um, but it had uh, the technical term stuffed up uh, because they hadn't actually uh, put in any evidence that the bylaws had been passed by a special resolution. Uh, or that the bylaws had even been registered. Um, so the amended bylaws weren't considered because there was no evidence that they'd ever been registered. And as we all know, a bylaw has to be registered to be able to be enforced. Um, so Mary, and I put it in here again, so the third reason why this case is a little bit um, unusual is that it stated that the power or purpose test, so a bylaw has to be within power or within the purpose, uh, of the Strata Schemes Management Act, and then the harsh, unconscionable and oppressive tests, they're alternatives. Only one of them needs to be met for the tribunal to have the jurisdiction to order that a bylaw is invalid um, under Section 150. So that was quite interesting to me. Um, so keep a look out for that case. It hasn't been quoted much, probably because it's only a tribunal member decision, um, but it's a little sleeper. I think we'll see more of that in the future. Um, I'm going back in time now because the previous cases were Cooper, which sort of set the standard. And then I told you about the cases after Cooper um, and how they've interpreted Cooper. This, and I'll skip over this reasonably quickly because I want to get to your questions because um, that's the, the interesting part. But these cases from here on in are all the cases that led up to Cooper. And you can see how it's that the, the um, case law has developed basically. Um, this is a bylaw that regulated access keys. Um, essentially, uh, John Mate Properties had lots that um, had car parks in one area uh, and the lot in another area. The scheme had a couple of different buildings uh, and what the person from John Mate Properties wanted to do was they wanted to access um, the garage where their lot was by walking through a building where the residence wasn't and there was no common facilities or anything. Um, and their bylaw had, or sorry, their bylaw that regulated access keys had said that the owners corporation could restrict access. Uh, and the owners corporation had, the key hadn't been coded to enter that building. Um, but there was also no purpose apart from this apparent shortcut um, to the other or to the garage. There was no purpose, no reason why the person from John Mate Properties would need to access this building. Um, and this was really um, uh, key in the decision as to why the bound bylaw was not harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Why? The restriction on the keys was to ensure the security of the building. There was no need for that particular lot owner to access their lot and there was no relevant common property areas for them to access in the building that they didn't have access to. Um, so there was a legitimate need to ensure the security of the building. That was, that was essentially it. Um, the second part of the decision um, as to why it wasn't harsh, unconscionable and oppressive was that the restriction on access wasn't absolute. The bylaw conditions allowed for a lot owner to apply to the strata committee to get their access changed. It also allowed them to apply for different keys. So I think they got I think it was two keys per bedroom um, and they could apply for more. Um, I think they had to pay for the additional cards, but there was a, there was a process in place for them to do it. Um, so this is one of the few bylaws that has not been found to be so 
to be harsh, unconscionable, and oppressive. So we can have legitimate security interests, basically, um, and we can have restrictions that aren't absolute embargoes. We kind of knew that um, restriction from Cooper because Cooper was very anti the absolute um, prohibition. So was Franklin, which was the absolute prohibition on cooking. Um, Davis, an interesting one, um, just put in there because it was a really strange bylaw, let's just say. Um, the bylaw said that where a lot owner had conducted work to their lot and the value of that work was over $500,000, sorry, $50,000, um, then the owner's corporation could inc increase, sorry, could collect any increase in the insurance premiums. Um, presumably, um, the owner's corporation thought that, well, this person's improved their lot to the value of uh, $50,000 or more. Um, we're going to have to uh, insure the building for more and therefore our insurance premiums are going to go up. Well, this bylaw was found to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Um, there is a provision if you want to try and uh, collect a differential um, of the insurance premium um, and it touches upon um, you can do it but only if the lot owner consents and only if the insurance premium has gone up because of a change in use. There's nothing under the Act that just says um, you can ask the lot owner to pay uh, an increase in insurance premiums or not even ask in this case, but tell them. Um, there is, as I said, a provision in the Act to do it and it is a lot more restricted than what this bylaw trying to do, um, which is you know, one of the reasons why it was harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Um, so here, there was no evidence of the change of use. Uh, the bylaw didn't provide for any exclusive use rights. Um, there was a reference back to our lovely Italian forum case, um, which basically that was a case where there was a promotional levy on certain commercial lots um, and it was upheld. Well, this that case has been held and used to say that matters of, a bylaw that concerns matters appropriate to the stripe, type of strata scheme um, are going to be valid. But we don't have, that was under the old 1996 Act, the Italian Forum decision, and that part of the Act under the 1996 Act did not make its way into the 2015 Act. Um, so the owners corporation couldn't rely upon the previous case law to say levy contributions from lot owners um, could be different from their unit entitlements. So again, we're talking about a costs bylaw. The owners corp's trying to recoup some money from its lot owners. Um, and the Davis case is saying, no, you can't. You can only levy contributions from lot owners in accordance with unit entitlements. There's no power to make this bylaw. There's actually a couple of other ways to do it. Um, but for the purposes of this case, um, there was no exclusive use rights, which is one of the ways to do it. Um, there was um, no decision of NCAP um, changing the distributions um, of the, the levy. Um, so you couldn't do it and the bylaw was invalid. Now, this is going to be the fun part. I have whizzed through the, the cases. And as I said, it's it's been a selection of the cases because I wanted you to see how varied the cases were. Um, one case that I probably should have talked about but didn't um, is rodent, um, and it had to do with animals. So I'm sort of segueing into some of our questions here. Um, it actually said that a lot owner was required to pay, I believe it was a bond, um, I don't think they used the word fee, um, for an application to keep an animal. Um, and that bylaw was not harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. So bonds are okay, um, as long as they are reasonable in nature. Limitations um, on use and restrictions of use are okay, as long as they are not absolute prohibitions. And jumping back to those three points in Cooper, they don't adversely affect the use of someone else's lot with no consideration um, of the benefits to, to lot owners as a whole and the use of the scheme by lot owners as a whole. So this adverse affectation test. Um, we can have potentially 
uh, cost recovery bylaws, but only in certain circumstances. The, the Lou case, the COSIQ case, um, the, the Neri case, they were all around cost recovery. Um, interestingly, in the Lou case and the COSIQ case, both of those cases had indemnity clauses saying that the lot owners indemnify the owner's corporation um, from any costs that the owner's corporation may incur because the lot owner had breached the bylaw. Those provisions weren't deemed to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. It was the provisions that said the cost is going to be a debt. It's going to be recoverable by, recoverable by the owner's corporation uh, and it's going to be treated as if it's a levy. That was the part that was considered harsh, unconscionable and oppressive and without power. So indemnities appear to be okay um, when they're in um, bylaws. Um, in the COSIQ case, COSIQ um, outright said in the decision that uh, there was a big difference between cost recovery provisions in just general bylaws and cost recovery provisions in um, bylaws that had exclusive use rights. Um, and the big difference was the exclusive use rights or common property bylaws they're now called. Um, the lot owner had to provide their written consent to those bylaws. So let's go through some of the questions that have been submitted previously. Um, keeping in mind these, these considerations, um, I just pulled some of the, the themes from the questions out, but the considerations, is the restriction negatively affecting somebody's property right without a good reason? Is the bylaw within the power of the owner's corporation to make? When you were speaking, Alison, one of the things that came to mind for me is quite regularly we get asked from our audience members when they're sending questions in whether there are uh, bylaw templates that they can use or whether they can or, or they'll let us know that they're writing their own bylaws and introducing their own bylaws. So we always recommend that people get legal advice. But how do you feel about bylaw templates and, and the model bylaws themselves? Um, look, I've, I've seen um, what I call a robo bylaw. Um, and that particular bylaw seems to be here, upload um, whatever your description of the work you want to do um, into our portal. And we will just um, PDF that with our PDF of a bylaw template. Um, and that whatever you've uploaded becomes an extra A to the bylaw. And the bylaw says, um, you know, the work in an extra A is authorised um, and the lot owner gets the exclusive use right of it and then has the responsibility to thereafter maintain and repair. Um, it's not a great bylaw, in my opinion. There's, there's no issues with the, I suppose, the, the pro forma part of the bylaw. The issue with I, that I have with it is that sometimes people do not know what to put in as a description of the work. And you either get people under-reporting the work or over-reporting the work. Um, two issues with that, the under-reporting of work means if it's not in your bylaw, you haven't authorised it. Um, and one of the really common questions I get is when I'm asked um, by people, why do I need a bylaw for this? And I say, well, is your work affecting um, the external appearance of the lot? Is your work affecting a, a, any waterproofing? Is your work requiring a development consent, for instance? So that's a consent from any other act. Or is your work involving any structural change? And I'll go, oh, no, 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 none of that. And I said, well, you're telling me it's bathroom renovations. I said, are you doing anything to the tiles in your bathroom? Oh, yes. I said, well, there's your waterproofing. Um, and then they say, oh, oh, okay. And I said, well, are you moving the shower and the bath? Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I said, okay, well, as a part of that, are you actually changing where the pipes are going through the slabs or through the walls? because that can be structural work. Um, you know, you need to have pipes or need to have um, floor slabs of certain weightings. You know, are you removing any walls? Do we know if they're structural walls or not? Um, so it's really, really common for people to come under report and they don't mean to. There's, I don't think there's any malice in it, just under report the work. Um, on the other hand, some people uh, over report what they're going to do and you, end up with this bylaw that's been passed that has photographs. Um, the LRS does not like, and in fact, their procedural guideline says we don't register photographs. Um, so there's one problem. Uh, oftentimes they're in colour. LRS does not accept in colour. 
Um, and oftentimes when you put it in black and white, it just doesn't read um, properly or show properly. Um, so, and the other issue is you can get all this superfluous information. Well, you know, I, I like people, which is why I do this job, but I don't need to know that you're painting your bathroom walls. Fuchsia, for instance, keep that between yourself and your significant other. Um, and that, that sort of stuff can end up in your bylaws. So that's that's sort of what I call the, the robo bylaw. And I do see that a fair bit. Um, I see other template bylaws. Um, and I know, you know some of my competitors have them. Uh, and I've supplied a few to, to strata managing agents. So, you know, I'll raise my hand. I've done it as well. Um, as long as they are drafted so that you, when you add in or, or there's, there's parts that you need to add in, um, and you actually add those parts in to the bylaw, um, not a problem, as well as a well-drafted bylaw. So by that, I mean, uh, I know I have um, a supplied a template bathroom works bylaw um, to some strata managers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have said stop using that because what has happened is they keep on forgetting to put the lot number that's being authorised and so they pass a bylaw that just says the, you know, refers to the owner. And then when you get to the definition of the owner, there's no lot. So the bylaw is useless. So you, you need to be really careful when using your precedents or using templates that read it, understand it. If you don't understand it, ask questions. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's actually going to suit your scheme. If the bylaw, for instance, talks about lifts and you don't have lifts, well, why would you use it? You know, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, I've got nothing against them. I just think people need to use them more carefully, put it that way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Keeping of animals. This, this question was basically, there was a, a um, owners or occupiers uh, shall be entitled to keep any animal upon their lot, provided that no dogs or cats other than assistance animals as prescribed by the legislation shall be allowed upon any lot or the common property. So you can keep any animal, but no dogs or cats, which was an interesting one. I've got no problems with restricting types of animals or where animals are kept or even numbers of animals. But I think you need to do it intelligently. Um, I'm not so sure that this one has been done um, with a, a great deal of thought behind it because one of the, or two of the most common animals that are kept are dogs and cats um, why is that restriction being imposed is it because you know like they had in the Franklin case it was an old aged care scheme and people literally had a room that had their bed had their lounge and then an ensuite bathroom so there was no room potentially well that doesn't necessarily rule out a small dog or a cat or a really lazy dog um, but you know what's what's the reason behind it um I would say at face glance, this one is likely to be very, very challengeable um, and harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. If it said, you know, you can have two dogs or, or two cats or one dog and one cat, um, I would be more okay and happy with that restriction. Um, if there was um, an ability to um, apply for a special exemption, such as um, we want to have three cats um, but two of them are 18 years old and all they do is lie on the bed all day, um, that would be, make the bylaw much less likely to be deemed harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Um, I did see a bylaw the other day about animals that said uh, you can keep snakes and other uh, venomous, sorry, non, sorry, snakes, reptiles and non-venomous creatures. Um, and then it took me a little while to go, oh, that's spiders. Um, and the like. And I thought, okay, well, I can see why that restriction would be imposed. Um, I don't necessarily like to think that, you know, people are keeping highly venomous creatures near me, unless, of course, they're securely contained. Um, and so maybe that bylaw should have had that proviso in it as well. But I thought, oh, well, that one's likely to withstand challenge. Um, so there's I think there's going to be some, and animals is going to be where the, the, the testing is going to come from, quite frankly, because we love our animals. Mm. Um, so I think that the boundaries of this are going to be tested and it's always going to come back to the scheme to say, well, how can you justify this restriction in the context of your scheme? Um, you're restricting a use right 
but in the context of your scheme, how does that adversely affect, you know, you keeping that animal, any other lot owner in your scheme? Um, maybe if you wanted to keep a, um, I don't know, a um, tank full of snakes and spiders on a balcony, don't know why you do it, uh, and the person next door to you was just an arachnophobe and couldn't stand snakes, that might be a very good reason. Um, but that would relate specifically to that scheme. So I've recently separated and need to sell my home to divide assets. I'm able to afford a lot in an over 55s community. They have a no pet policy. I have a medium sized dog. He's generally quiet and well behaved. I want to be able to purchase a house in this community and keep my dog. Is there a policy on pet? Is their policy on pets enforceable, or can I make a case to keep my dog with a promise to keep him quiet and clean and not disturb the other residents? Yeah. So we hear about cases like this quite a lot. Oh, absolutely. And I'll I'll just give you an example um, of. Um, a case that we have up here in Newcastle that um, Fern Bay, um, which is seaside at Fern Bay, um, it does have restrictions on keeping dogs and cats. Um, why? Uh, because there are restrictions on title, so registered restrictions on title. Um, and so they would override anything in the community management statement or a bylaw. Um, but those restrictions on title are there because if there's a koala popula population. So you can keep your animals, but you have to keep them within your yards or on leash and you can only let them outside during sunlight hours, essentially. Um, you know, and their, their bylaws go so far as to say, because there's restrictions on title, that if you have a pool or a, a pond or any water source over a certain size, you've got to have some means to allow animals to crawl back out. So sometimes there will be a restriction that is registered on the title um, and will be registered on the title of the community um, property or the common property. Um, it might also be registered on the title of your lot, but generally it's on the title of the community property or the um, the law, uh, sorry, the, the common property. Um, so look to see if there's any registered restrictions. Apart from situations like the seaside at Fern Bay, where there's a very specific circumstance as to why, you know, native wildlife endanger koalas, we need to protect them. Um, it's very, very rare to see them, but it does happen. So I noticed you're saying it's a no pets policy in this one. Um, I'd be very curious to see if there was a no pets bylaw. Um, if there's a no pets bylaw, and this comes to one of the themes that we were talking about, you know, how do you enforce them? Well, a bylaw is valid while it's in for, while it's registered, basically. Um, so you have to comply with the bylaw while it's registered but you can take it to NCAT to challenge it. And NCAT says it's unenforceable, it's invalid from the day that it started or the day that it was passed. So you should be trying to comply with the bylaws that you've got. Um, but most schemes have looked at the Cooper decision and gone, holy heck, we need to change our pets bylaw. We can't have an absolute prohibition on pets because the minute it gets challenged, it's going to go out the window. Um, so the sensible... Um, owners corporations and community associations that have got that um, have started changing their their policies sorry I shouldn't say policies their bylaws um, in your case um, I'd look at the bylaws if it says very very clearly no pets I'd be raising a letter to the manager and saying are you aware of this Cooper case um, it is widely, widely reported. Um, if you jump onto your website, you'll actually see I've got a Law Society Journal article I wrote for them about Cooper, basically saying these, these bylaws are going to be a no-no. Um, so you can a pin, or, or pin that onto it. Um, there'll be lots of other articles as well um, and say, are you aware that this bylaw, if challenged, will be invalid? Suggest very highly that you change your bylaw. Uh, and here's my application to keep my animal. Someone's actually put a comment in there just to say excessive excessive barking seems to be a bone of contention, but I'm under the <laughs> understanding. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm under the understanding that um, that could be that that's more of a nuisance that, that would fall under nuisance bylaw. Is that right? So you would in, sort of enforce the bylaws under nuisance if you've got a dog that's in the scheme that's barking, or you'd actually use the provisions under the Act that say that um, you can ask the owner to remove the animal because they're not complying. Um, so there's actually, and this is Cooper talked about this a fair, a fair bit, to say, well, there's actually provisions under the Act to remove animals from schemes that are causing hazards. 
Um, and there are new sections in the Act, I think it's 137B, um, that says um, this, these are what are reasonable um, requirements, basically. So you need to um, use what you've got. Nuisance is one of them, which is an order under 153, um, but you could also use the removal of, of dogs. Essentially, it's mostly dogs. Don't, well, A, cats can't bark. Um, B, they don't generally make that much noise. Um, all right, we might just, just because we're running out of time here, we had another one, and this one was to do with um, exclusive uh, use bylaws. Mm -hmm. So it was a four ground floor units in a 30-year-old block of 12 all have exclusive use bylaws. Two of the bylaws specify a fee for use. Attempts to establish reasonable fees for the other two have been defeated by a majority vote at the OC meeting. The bylaw stated that the owners shall maintain the areas in good order. In good order, sorry, all of the areas have been the subject of extensive modifications by successive owners, including paving and garden beds and balcony windows converted to doors, etc. And whenever the owners corporation needs to go into that area for maintenance or plumbing or drainage they've paid to remove and then restore the modifications. So all of the all of the areas, so exclusive use areas are, are valuable assets that appear prominent in sales presentations as a dominant feature of the lots and the four lots all have the lowest unit entitlements. So the OC gets no benefit from nor use or access to the building's grounds because apart from the parking and driveways, the exclusive use areas com comprise the entire um, of the building's lots. So there's no other common property at all. So can the majority vote demand that no fees are payable if two bylaws state otherwise? Can the two bylaws that effectively gift OC land to the lots be overturned on the basis that they're unfair? And can all four bylaws, both with and without fee clauses, be, be declared unreasonable? Yeah, good question. Um, you could try challenging them under section 139, subsection one, which is the one we've been talking about. Bylaw must not be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. I think in your case, um, the better thing to do would be to put a motion up at a general meeting um, to repeal the bylaws or to amend the bylaws to add in requirements to pay um, for the exclusive use areas. Uh, and then once that gets voted down, you've actually got the ability under subsection, uh, sorry, section 149 of the Strata Schemes Management Act. Um, and that section allows you to go to NCAT for an order that the bylaw has either unreasonably been refused to be consented to or unreasonably hasn't been passed. And that can be an amendment or an actual bylaw or a repeal. So I think that's where you probably have more success and you'd be weighing very heavily on, um, well, I have to pay, you know, ten dollars for mine every year, and these people have, you know, double the size. I'm not sure how much it was, but I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating. Double the size of the exclusive use area, and they don't pay anything. That's not fair. Um, so that's how you go and challenge that sort of bylaw. And I think, look, it, it would depend upon the NCAT member on the day. Um, but I think there is an argument there uh, on the basis of just general fairness, um, quite frankly. Um, why should two lots be paying and the other two lots not have to pay a thing? Um, I suspect what it, how this situation arose is because two of the lots got the bylaws through um, back when it was uncommon to make people pay for the common property rights or the exclusive use. Uh, and the other two people came in later and got their bylaws later when it was much more common to request payment. Um, so I think there is a fairness situation here that you know the tribunal would look at addressing. Um, but you need to you'd need to have very very good evidence as that goes to the unfairness on this. Um, so hopefully that one answered that question. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then we had another one. Um, how do we convince all owners to obtain independent advice regarding updating our old outdated bylaws? Does NCAT have the authority to make an order to update bylaws? We have the original no pets bylaw in place from the 1960s and the committee will not consider updating this, although there are plenty of pets in the building. Yeah, well, hopefully you heard my sigh because this I, I get asked this question a lot um, and I'm sure the strata managers listening hear it a lot as well uh, because I'm sure their advice would be you need to update them. Well, within 12 months of the Strata Schemes Management Act commencing on the 30th of November 2016, there was a requirement that all bylaws be reviewed. 
um, for very similar reasons to what we're talking about today. Things change over time. Uh, a bylaw that I pass today might not be valid in 20 years um, because of case law or just circumstances. Um, so it is an extraordinarily good idea to review your bylaws. Um, if you don't get legal advice, go through and just go through bylaw by bylaw to say, okay, well, this one relates to parking. Do we have any issues with parking? What are they? What could be a good rule to address that? Um, what's reasonable in this circumstance? Ideally, you get independent legal advice um, and that person giving the legal advice would then give recommendations and perhaps motions um, to amend the bylaws just to bring them up to date. Um, I think that the, the easiest way to say to people is, well, you know, 20 years ago, I, you know, if I looked at my clothes from 20 years ago, I wouldn't wear them today. <laughs> um, one, I wouldn't fit. Um, two, I think I'd be pretty darn daggy. Uh, pretty sure I was daggy 20 years ago, but pretty sure I'm daggier now. Uh, and three, they'd probably have been worn out because I'm a terror with clothes and they've probably, you know, there's a good reason why they're not still in existence. Um, so use that analogy if you can. Like there's, there's really good reasons. Things just don't, things change. Um, the other part of the question was whether NCAT can make an order that the bylaws have to be reviewed. Well, NCAT has a really broad power under Section 232 of the Australia Schemes Management Act, um, but that power is, um, or the, the broad part of that power has to do with disputes, um, and so settling um, disputes, or where the owners corporation has failed to exercise a function or hasn't exercised it properly. Um, is a failure to review its bylaws um, a failure of its functions? Well, if it didn't do it within 12 months of 30th of November 2015, yes. Um, but then NCAT's question would be, well, it's 2023. Why have you waited so long to make a claim? Um, clearly, there was no issue with the bylaws. Um, so I think that one would probably go down. Um, the other um, part, which is, you know, a dispute amongst lot owners, well, is there a dispute? Do some people want the bylaws changed? If you do want the bylaws changed, um, then perhaps um, put a motion on the agenda um, of the general meeting that the owners corporation has its bylaws independently reviewed um, and see how you go. And if it's voted down, um, well, then there is a dispute. Um, I pick a dispute about a certain bylaw, like the pets bylaw, because that's an easy one, uh, because we've got very good case law around that now. Um, but pick, pick an easy bylaw, and then there's your dispute. If that doesn't, you say, well, I want to keep a pet, um, this is a no pets bylaw, well, you can either challenge the decision not to review the bylaws, or you could challenge that particular bylaw. Um, there's no sort of at large um, power of NCAT to say you must review your bylaws. Why? Because it would kind of re require them to then say you have to engage a lawyer and here's the bylaws that we think are wrong. So they're kind of predetermining the issue. Okay, thanks, Alison. And there was a bit of interesting background to that that I didn't mention, but I think what had happened was there was a husband and wife that had lived in a, in a really well-run building and they had their bylaws up to date and everything was fine and their children had then gone off and purchased in this other building that was sort of close by that had these old bylaws. The, there were pets in the building, although there was a no pet bylaw, things just don't seem to be running very well in that building. And so I think they were looking at the disparity between the two, the two types of strata living, which is interesting in itself because <laughs> uh, I think it's, a, it's an indication of um, what's happening out there. Yeah, look, I, I think there's a whole heap of schemes that have just taken the ostrich approach and they're just not interested. They don't want to um, to get involved, quite frankly. Mm. Uh, I've seen a, a couple of, I'm looking at the chat as we've been talking um, and there's, there's you know, been a, a couple of other questions um, coming up here as well. I'll try and quickly answer them because I know we're very, very short on time. Um, owners charging... Uh, sorry, owners corporations charging residents and owners for keeping a pet in strata, um, not a bond, not a fee. Um, oh, a bond, I can see that could be the case because ideally that would be if the animal soils, um, you know, part of the common property or damages it, um, then you could use the bond for that. Um, a fee for considering the application, 
that's already been determined in the Roden case to be okay. Just uh, you want to keep a pet, pay me $2,000. Got a bit of a problem with that. Um, not everybody had had $2,000 to start off with. Um, and you're restricting somebody's property rights by virtue of how much money they can afford to pay. How to manage when both committee members, team of two, say no to an NCAT application. That's when you take it and you put a, a motion on the agenda of the general meeting. Any lot owner can put a motion on the agenda of the, the general meeting. Um, just depends on whether or not you're financial um, as to whether you get a vote on that. Um, and you put the motion on the agenda to take um, a particular bylaw uh, to NCAT to be challenged. How uh, how can we enforce penalty a bylaw, e.g. E parking infringement? Uh, very quickly, you need to have a look at the Neri case. Uh, I suspect you're not going to be able to, um, Sebastian. I, and, and that's on the basis, so I suspect it's going to be deemed to be um, uh, harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. But what about mixed use schemes? Can a bylaw restrict owners of commercial property lots from accessing the swimming pool when all lot owners contribute to the common property upkeep? Well, you can actually have a bylaw where you'd say the exclusive use right for the pool is belongs to all of the lot owners of the residential lots, but then you also make them pay for it. Um, that would get up. Uh, but a bylaw saying commercial can't use um, the pool if you're contributing to that. I think that could be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. I think we're in a you get what you pay for society. Um, if I'm paying for it, I want to use it, um, even if it's just to look at and dip my toe in once every six months. Where does a term companion come to play for a pet when you purchased a property where you could have any animal and kept property whilst overseas? When returned bylaw changed to no pets animals? Uh, well, the, the bylaw that says no pets animals is going to be harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Um, and that's that's the Cooper case. Um, so you need to raise that case with your um, owner's corporation. A companion animal uh, is an animal that is registered as a companion animal um, and has some form of training um, to alleviate um, with a disability. So there is a Companion Animals Act and that's where those animals come into play. Is it harsh for the Strata Committee to charge $275 to orientate each new tenant? apart from one tenant in each calendar year if the owner chooses to rent out their property for short-term rental. Ooh, I'd love to see the terms of that bylaw. Um, that could be a very interesting one to pick apart. Um, I suggest that's on the WIFI side, uh, but I'd have to see the terms of that bylaw. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's not passing my, my smell test at the moment. Cost recoveries where an owner signs a consent form are okay. What about the two-year consent clause in section 143? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the section 143 um, refers to common property rights bylaws or exclusive use bylaws, um, and that's the consent form. That's the, the COSAQ case said um, cost recovery provisions in common property rights bylaws, they're different. They're, they're not harsh, unconscionable, and oppressive. Um, I have personally drafted bylaws where... I've done the costs and said, okay, go out and make all the lot owners sign in writing that we agree to this bylaw so that if it gets challenged later, um, we can rely upon their consent. Um, so I have done that. Um, we haven't seen any challenges to that, but I'm basing that going out and getting people to consent to it in writing on the decision in COSAQ, which distinguished the, um, the exclusive use rights bylaws on the basis that there'd been a written consent to them. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Hope everybody got something out of it. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.